The first season of Transformers Earthspark has finally come to a close. Across 26 episodes, we followed a new race of Transformers born out of the Earth itself as a government conspiracy unraveled around Optimus and a reformed Megatron in the rural town of Witwicky. It's a Transformers show that brought a lot of new elements to the table and pushed the franchise forward in a lot of ways, but it's also been a lightning rod for controversy, with very public detractors making their opinions known in just about every comment section regarding the show. So I've been really excited to go through Earthspark and break it down. Something which slowly dawned on me post high school is that I will never again be the primary age demographic of Transformers. I know it sounds goofy, but it truly just genuinely never crossed my mind as a possibility, in any capacity, until it happened. As such, I'm self-aware enough to know that my criticisms of Earthspark inherently mean less than they might have when I was a 16-year-old reviewing Cyberverse. The creative team of Earthspark won't be losing any sleep because a man who's graduated college has some issues with their show, and I know that. The show released on Paramount Plus in three batches, so I'd just like to go batch by batch and cover the good, the mixed, and the bad. But first, I'd like to discuss two very common criticisms that Transformers Earthspark has been receiving and deflect both of them, because I think they're very outlandish. If you look at any post about Earthspark, you'll see so many comments saying they should cancel this baby show and make something as dark and mature as Transformers Prime again. This is the single most ridiculous criticism of the show I've ever seen, by far. Earthspark reaches the intensity of Prime regularly and consistently. <laughs> You cannot look at Robbie poisoned by the cyber sleeve, or the death of Agent Croft, or the final evolution of Dr. Meridian, and tell me that this is a show designed for preschool children. Think back to the things that scared you during developmental childhood, and then compare that imagery to this. Large swaths of Earthspark would be genuinely frightening to kids pre-kindergarten. It's still obviously a show for older kids, but so was Transformers Prime. They don't show commercial bumpers like this on shows for adults. The Hub Saturday Mashup Family Prime with the best Hub shows all mashed up like Transformers Prime. Someone stole your pants! Saturday starting at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 Pacific, only on The Hub. We watched Prime when we were kids at the age where we wanted to be adults and that's why we thought of it as so adults. In the same way that the Autobot Massacre in the 86 movie May G1 crystallize in so many people's heads as all being that violent, when in, in reality, not a single piece of the show reaches that level. People think of Cliffjumper's death in Prime and think the entire show was like that. Not a single other moment in Prime reaches that level of harshness. And if you remove just those two scenes with Cliffjumper, Earthspark is a consistently darker, more violent, and more mature series than Prime. In the final few episodes, you can count the jokes on one hand. It's a non-stop, dire, intense atmosphere. Earthspark has everything adult we remember from Prime. Prime has so much violence! Well, first of all, all of that was TVY7, but yes, so does Earthspark. Prime had Transformers bleeding energon in serious pain! Yes, Earthspark too! And the Disney Channel showed humans and animals bleeding blood! Blood's actually real! Well, Prime had a human get tortured and, and mutilated and die! Mm-hmm, take a card. In addition, Earthspark, through allegory, offers commentary on actual adult topics of conversation. Freedom versus security, generational trauma, the pain of closeting your identity, gender identity, how society treats immigrants, facing the messes left behind by previous generations. Gen he is the one who let it get that far. Now he wants to put the weight of it on our shoulders, you know? And it presents these themes in a kid accessible way, but tell me, what does Prime have that even resembles this? There are no adult themes in Prime, there's just mild violence and intense music. It's baffling to me that so much of the ragging on Earthspark seems to come from fans of Prime, because it is everything that Transformers Prime fans have been asking for for 10 years. And maybe a big reason for that is that this scary cliff jumper scene we all remember was written by the showrunner of Earthspark, Nicole Dubuque. Earthspark is far and away more similar to Prime than anything else in this entire franchise. Transformers Prime fans need to rewatch Prime to remember what it was actually like, and then give Earthspark a chance. The next controversy has been Nightshade, the franchise's first on-screen non-binary Transformer. The culture war has been mainstream enough to warrant a section on the Wikipedia page. 
As countless news outlets and media personalities heralded Earthspark as another example of go woke, go broke. As in, the philosophy that everything woke is inherently destined to fail financially. Except for this thing, and 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 this thing. Here's the thing about the Nightshade outrage. All of it is a grift. If these people were actually upset about it, they would have released their videos in November when the episode came out. But instead, notice how all of these videos came out in May and June. Why? Because there was a new Transformers movie about to come out because they were writing trends to be as profitable as possible. All of this outrage is artificially generated. These people wait until the peak window of profitability and then pretend to be upset, getting millions of viewers all riled up, painting an arbitrary group of people as the others, and then cashing in. All of it is a scam, and you're falling for it. If you think of Earthspark as a woke agenda show, first of all, I'd like you to define the word woke for me, as it seems that most people upset about it don't seem to agree on what it means, because it's used as a blanket catch-all term. But secondly, let's actually examine the runtime. 10 seconds in episode 10, where Nightshade says they don't go by he or she. Then there's a collective 40 seconds in episode 17, where Nightshade learns the word non-binary. That's 50 seconds spent discussing gender in any capacity. These episodes are 22 minutes apiece when you remove the credits and intro card. There's 26 of them. So a grand total of 0.14% of the show is what's accounting for all of this fake outrage. If you're bothered by a Transformers robot caring about his gender, surely you're also bothered by Transformers feeling joy, grief, anger, passion, fear, lust, jealousy, whatever this is. Every emotion and feeling that a Transformer has ever had is a human emotion felt by humans. They have very clearly, very blatantly had genders and pronouns since day one in 1984. Rhyme told me there'd be days like this, and you didn't believe him. Nothing about Earthspark is convincing kids to become non-binary. It's just showing them something that exists in real life, something that they're going to encounter anyways. And let's see a kid does become non-binary. What's the problem? It's not like he's getting a tattoo or something. If they decide later that it's not for them, they can just change their mind. What's the issue? That it's not what's on their birth certificate? If that's the case, then we better stop normalizing nicknames. We don't want kids to watch cartoons and think that it's okay to have a nickname. What is Ferb short for? I don't know. On a fundamental level, what is the concern with non-binary people? Let's say your friend comes out as non-binary. What changes? In your interactions with them? Absolutely nothing. When you're discussing them with someone else, you change one word. That's it. The idea that they, them pronouns are completely made up is absurd because so is the concept of gender, so is the concept of he and she, so are all rules in society. Everything, every term, every word, every idea is made up by human beings. The only difference is that they, them pronouns are a social convention which have only been accepted more recently than the rest. Think about how many things were controversial when introduced. Barcode scanners. Seatbelts. Desegregation. A certain subset of people will always be resistant to change, progress, and anything that challenges their worldview. And those people are always immortalized in history as nothing but villains and clowns. If you're riled up about, like, eight lines of dialogue in a kid's show, I think you need to take a step back and stop spending so much time and energy thinking about a group of people who are just living their own lives and could not care less about you. And with all of that out of the way, let's finally dive into the good elements of the first batch of Transformers Earthspark. After five years of every Transformers show taking a basic G1-inspired direction, Earthspark opted to do something pretty original and very inspired. Post-war, the Transformers have lost contact with Cybertron, and the wars ended. Optimus Prime and the Autobots have teamed up with a shady human organization called Ghost to hunt down the rogue Decepticons. They operate out of this small ghost town called Witwicky, which, true to name, is largely a hidden staging ground for the organization's operations. Dot Malto, a veteran of the Transformers War, is dragged out to Witwicky with her family to be a park ranger, which turns out to all be a ruse to recruit her to Ghost, at the recommendation of her former ally Megatron, who's reformed and working alongside Optimus. Dot's children discover a mysterious Ember Stone, which creates 
Terran Transformers out of the Earth, with which they share a mental and emotional link. Optimus sees the Terrans as the future of their race and decides to hide them from Ghost, assigning a fugitive Bumblebee to be their protector. Name a Transformer show with a premise that even resembles that. A literal ghost train? I don't even want to know what this thing's hauling. That's not to mention Dr. Meridian, another war veteran who seeks to annihilate the Cybertronian race, descending into madness and becoming more machine than man along the way. There's so many layers to everything, and because all of these elements are created originally for this series, because they aren't pulling Terrans or Mandroid from pre-existing source material, it means we truly don't have the slightest clue where things are heading. We don't know the answers to the show's questions as opposed to something like animated where a mysterious blue car shows up and you're just like, oh hey, it's Blur. Tensions are growing between Prime and Megatron regarding Faith and Ghost and the ethics of their apprehension of Decepticon prisoners. Does it not concern you that our human allies control where Decepticons live and what form they take, even in times of so-called peace? This is not freedom. Is Megatron gonna turn on Optimus, or is Optimus gonna defy Ghost? You can tell throughout the season it's building to one of those outcomes, but it's not clear what, and that's great. The mental link between the kids and the Terrans allows the human protagonists to be relevant and essential in a way they've never quite been before, as they're at the core of the show's central mystery. Normally, Transformers shows have to make a choice during pre-production. Is their existence public knowledge to everyone in the city, or are they operating from the shadows and hiding their existence? Transformers Earthspark, very cleverly, chose to do both, with Transformers being widely known about by humanity, but the Terrans being a secret from Ghost. They were able to have their cake and eat it too while exploring both premises simultaneously. We get heroic Megatron on screen for the first time, and they introduce him as a hero, long defected right off the bat, rather than retreading his long character arc for more than meets the eye. This prevents him from just being a lesser version of James Roberts' Megatron, and allows him to come into his own, with little glimpses of his history here and there to make you understand as much as you need to about him. The priorities have changed. They had to, for the survival of all Cybertronians. If you and Optimus were enemies, How'd you get him to trust you? By scanning an Earth vehicle. Putting Megatron in a protagonist role was an amazing way to shake up Earthspark even further, showing him fighting alongside Optimus and the Terrans regularly, while making it very clear. He's still Megatron, and he has skeletons in his closet. Seeing Megatron act as a dad, a caring father figure, while grappling with his past is the most novel concept of this show, and to me it's unforgettable. Careful, little bird. The show has really pleasant human characters in the form of the Malto family. Robbie and Moe never get on my nerves, although I'll be honest when I say I don't care that much about them. The standouts to me are Alex and Dot. Alex being a quirky, silly little man with Isaac Sumdak energy. <laughs> Does this mean Bumblebee is coming to live with us? With Dot being a very competent, protective mother who's up to her neck with all the nonsense going on around her. Did you take that baby from the woods? Hmm. Huh. When you say it like that, it sounds like a bad thing. Agent Schloeder, another classic Transformers government agent, makes an amazing impression with his limited appearances. His obsessive hunt to find Bumblebee was among the highlight of every batch. Playground chatter saved my squad in the Knee Slapper Valley incident. Oh. Just like my sixth birthday. The main Transformers we spend time with in the first batch are Twitch and Thrash. Thrash is thrill-seeking but rebellious. It didn't dawn on me while watching the show, but he has the same personality as all the classic Kid Appeal characters. And I think I literally just didn't notice because he is not yellow. I'll be honest when I say I'm largely indifferent to him, but who I really enjoy is Twitch, who has this sense of childlike wonder, views everything as a game, but is also extremely analytically minded. We've seen characters with these traits before, but never rolled all together like this, and I think they add up to create a super memorable character. You can be my dad number two! So, what are we doing out here, Dad 2? And her sleek design certainly helps. This is one of my favorite Transformer designs of all time. Twitch is the only Earthspark toy that I bothered getting in any capacity because I just love how she looks. And also, she can't even hold her swords. Like, that's such a bizarre oversight to me. It wouldn't take any more material. I, I don't understand. This is the most money that's ever been spent on a Transformers show's voice cast. Almost everyone is an actor you've heard of, who's been in shows you've heard of. Multiple Game of Thrones actors, high profile guest stars, voice actors with huge portfolios, and Optimus and Bumblebee are voiced by Alan Tudyk 
and Danny Pudi, respectively, two very well-established actors in the industry. Tudyk as Optimus delivers an original take that stands alongside Gary Chalk or David Kaye. While it doesn't stick out to me as a franchise best, and I do wish they'd gotten Peter Cullen while he was still around, it's miles better than the awful wooden impressions of the last half decade, and a huge sigh of relief. Nice job, cadets. Stand down. I'll take it from here. Pudi as Bumblebee, meanwhile, inhabits the character effortlessly, some of the most genius casting. I've been a fan of Pudi for years, but him as Bumblebee never crossed my mind, and it's like he was born to play the character. I'm not leaving until you're safe. That's what being a team, a family, means. Other highlights are Rory McCain as Megatron, a far gentler and softer take which communicates his regret really clearly, as well as his repressed frustration regarding his disillusion with Ghost. Steve Blum returns as Starscream, by far my favorite actor the character's ever had, and he settles into the role again without missing a beat. We'll talk more about him later. Yes! I have it! Katherine Kavari has this infectious energy as Twitch. Stephanie Lemelin does this cool squeak in her voice as hashtag. John John Briones depicts Alex Malto as a, an incredibly eager little guy who's just happy to be there. And hearing him talk at TFCon was great because that's literally just what he sounds like in real life. And speaking of that TFCon, there was a moment where someone went up to the mic and held up a Human Alliance figure to all the voice actors and was like, they just don't make toys like this anymore. And it's like, dog, dog, stop it, stop it, stop it. The, uh, the voice actors, these four voice actors sitting at this table don't make the toys. Why are you complaining about that to them? And then uh, 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 Zeno Robinson, the voice of Thrash, an absolute hero, just like, he, he spoke into his little mic thing, he's like, whoa, that's so cool, can I see that? And he had the guy like walk up and show him. And he, his remarkable scale and courage saved that from being the most cringe, awkward thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Zeno, you're a hero. Like, you're really gonna hold up this toy from 10 years ago and be like, gosh, they don't make them like this anymore. Like, yeah, and in 2010, they didn't make them like they made them in the 2000s. And in the 2000s, they didn't make them like they made them in the 90s. And in the 90s, they didn't make them like they made them in the 80s. Shut up! In 2034, someone's gonna be like, man, they don't make Transformers toys like this anymore. Transformers Earthspark has, hands down, the best storyboarding that any show in this entire franchise has ever had. I'd consistently watch scenes and moments and just go, I need to see what the animatic looks like. And thankfully, most of these artists are publicly posting their work. Bumblebee, hold on to this, would you? The storyboards could act as a final product in and of themselves sometimes. Not only do casual conversational shots have interesting and dynamic compositions, but the action is incredible. This hangar bay fight from the ninth episode is one of, if not the most compelling action sequence in the entire 40 year history of the brand. I deeply, truly mean that, and I still feel that almost a year after its release. The use of vehicle parts in combat, the use of transformation, it's everything I love about a Transformers fight with some of the wildest camera work, sharpest animation, and hardest score of all time. Optimus. A close runner-up is the climax of part two. The animatic for the entire seven minute action climax is on the Doig and Swift YouTube channel, and I absolutely recommend you watch it. The hangar fight was talked about more because it was the first time Earthsparks showed us what it was capable of. It surprised everyone, but this one should not be swept under the rug at all. Ant Ward, Dale Melanowski, a lot of the big names attached to Earthspark come straight from Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and they used those connections, hired many of the same storyboard artists for an end result that is a larger caliber of talent than a Transformers show has ever had. Compare this to Animated, where the storyboards would come back from overseas and they were so bad that Matt Youngberg would have to rush and redraw half the panels to correct continuity and composition. We've come a long way, and I'm soaking in Earthspark's visuals for as long as I can because I know there is no way Transformers will stay this way forever. With the exception of G1, which has its hand in everything, Cyberverse has far and away the largest influence on the show, with a lot of concepts from that series making their return. Southern Twinged Wheeljack, pairing a Rainmaker and a Classic Seeker as a duo, Skywarp and Nova Storm's Gender Swap, Prime Social Awkwardness, Grimlock's Bruce Banner dynamic between his beast and robot modes, the 2D effects integration, which might I just add, looks incredible. 
Just in general, Cyberverse has left a massive footprint on the brand, given how obscure it seemed upon its debut. And I think that's because at least one Cyberverse writer has been present on every Transformers show since, with the exception of BotBots, reusing ideas whether consciously or unconsciously. And now we've reached what I consider the mixed elements of the first batch. Transformers Earthspark sound design is about middle of the road as far as Transformers shows go. Far better than Prime, which had a very limited, repetitive sound library. But not quite near the sophistication of animated. Interestingly, Jeff Schiffman, who was a sound designer on Transformers Animated before getting promoted to co-sound supervisor by the end of the run, returns as a sound designer on Earthspark. And as a result, in many of the episodes he worked on, you can hear sounds he designed 15 years ago for Transformers Animated getting reused. You are no longer of use to me. And on that note, I haven't done a full sweep through of the credits, but names in Earthspark that immediately stood out to me as having worked on TFA, Brian Pinaranda, who was a prop designer credited on most of the episodes. Here he has an Ascento on the end, which makes me wonder if Animated had miscredited his last name that whole time. And secondly, Arenio Maramba, who was a frequent episode director, and in season three, a full-time character designer. To my understanding, the only full-time character designer besides Derek, as everyone else worked freelance. But speaking about sound again, Earthspark definitely comes nowhere close to the heights of Animated overall. There, every character has their own distinct library of sounds, footsteps, all designed to match the personalities of the characters, higher pitch for B with buzzing, creak gear for ratchet. Here, all the Terrans sound largely the same in their movements. Now we can wrestle. They're ignoring me, Bumblebee. Battle Scout. It sounds like they are accounting for the character's weights, but there's not much expression beyond that. Like there's enough variation. Autobots sound like big heavy metal steel when they get hit. Whereas Terrans sound more like a hollow plastic. There's a handful of really great auditorily satisfying sounds like Twitch hovering. But there are also moments where they spam the same sound over and over, and I feel like I'm watching Prime. That was unaltered footage from Earthspark. Look what I just did in nine minutes using Premiere Pro's rudimentary modulation filters. The show's proven it has a large library of sounds to choose from, so I think it was just a matter of limited time to design, mix, and master Earthspark. The music for this series doesn't sound like anything else we've quite heard before. The main theme isn't just a remix of older motifs. It's a very synthy beat that feels mysterious, exciting, yet simultaneously relaxing. The music in the show just sticks out as awe-inspiring several times throughout, and there has not been a single moment in the Transformers franchise where the soundtrack stood out to me since Lockdown's theme in 2014. It's also really interesting how abruptly it's edited to cut off in every single act break. I like it, it's different. But the score is never really memorable or jaw-dropping, and it gets pretty repetitive. I'll constantly find myself thinking, oh, there's the same techno beat we hear every action scene. It's not as repetitive as Prime, but Prime also had the best Transformers music of all time. Earthspark doesn't, and it just gets kind of distracting when you hear the same tracks over and over and said tracks aren't masterpieces by Brian Tyler. Swindle's an Earthspark. I've always been a huge fan of Swindle, and here he's a perfectly valid interpretation of the character, but he doesn't leave much of an impression at all. I think he's definitely the most forgettable take on Swindle, with only two moments that stick out to me as classic Swindleisms. Don't act like I'm not here. It's rude. My brother, hot top. 
<laughs> he disappeared while saving orphans during the war. He doesn't seem to be an arms dealer or a con man in this version. He's just a sleazeball manipulator, and I think it shows understanding of the character, but they don't choose to do anything notable with him. He also has a twin brother named Hardtop, and it's an addition that I'm pretty indifferent to. Seems very random, I don't really get it. If the brother Bond was there to justify Swindle trying to break him out of prison throughout the season, I think there's other ways they could have done that. Hardtop could have owed Swindled money or something. I could imagine a scenario where their voice budget was limited, given how much they were spending, and they only had the money to have one guy voice both of these Decepticon characters and made them brothers for that reason. Again, I don't know. But Swindle's gun pops out of his vehicle mode in an identical manner to animated, so that's neat. I placed the designs down here in the mixed column. They're generally well-liked, but there have been two major points of criticism I've seen. Optimus's face is weird and unsettling, and Moe's eyes are weird and unsettling. And as opposed to the top of this video, I do find myself inclined to agree. You settle into it a bit once they're in motion. Mo pretty much always looks scary. I wouldn't say this about her if she wasn't fictional, but she is an ugly little girl. And at one point in the concept art phase, her eyes were perfectly normal. I don't know what happened. Optimus at least looks fine from several angles. I can imagine this as a 2D sketch, which looked great on paper, but just didn't survive the transfer to 3D. Here's my main problem. The Terrans have these layered, curvy designs that are fresh and new. Nick Roche, a very popular Transformers comic artist, is a big reason for that, as he's a primary character developer on Earthspark. But unfortunately, Hasbro is still hanging on to its evergreen designs, which homogenized the appearances of the characters in the name of brand synergy for half a decade. They're clearly letting go quite a bit, as you can see in this animated-inspired Roche Megatron design that looks nothing like evergreen, but is still plainly painfully present on B and Optimus. Roche did a good enough job making B still look dynamic and cool, but Optimus... <sighs> I don't know who designed Prime here, but he's just a box. To me, he looks really out of place next to all these other characters. And I don't think that's a slight against the designer, I think that's Hasbro imposing mandates on how this character looks. There's a lot of Autobots who look like they were designed with a restrained approach and I wish they'd gone as wild as they did with Twitch and Thrash. Overall, I just wish the show was 2D, because I think these designs would have looked more impressive. The art pieces for the flashbacks look incredible, the concept art for all these characters looks incredible, and I think that 2D would have been a better medium to showcase all of this. Whenever I see Earthspark rendered in 2D, I'm always taken aback by how good it looks, and I didn't often feel that while watching the series. And finally, the bad stuff of Batch 1. First, two minor things. There's no theme song. It's just a logo, and that's lame. I'd rather have a bad theme song, or a really bad theme song, than not have one at all. And Alita 1 doesn't do anything at all this whole season. I think they should have had Alita be the guest teacher instead of RC, so she could have actually had an important role in at least one episode's narrative. To get to the larger criticisms, I think the show is very out of touch when it comes to the writing on his child characters. All of it feels like adult writers who don't spend time around kids just guessing what today's youth might talk like and guessing incorrectly at that. Just one more text. TFBFFs confirmed. Slow down. I don't have turbo legs. Well, you're, that's not, I don't. Ah! It was like the sleeve thing was sending me feels from someone else. Feels? Feels was a popular term for like three months pre-pandemic. Maybe when this show was in pre-production, but animation takes so long, you cannot throw in a currently trendy term like this because it's gonna date itself. When this first episode aired, I was so taken aback at hearing feels because I genuinely hadn't heard that in years. I forgot it was even a term. Weird feels, really weird feels. And no one used it in that context. Sorry, some back from Transformers Animated felt like a generally accurate approximation of an eight-year-old girl, because Marty Eisenberg had two daughters that age when he was story editing the series. Having watched the show at Sorry's age, I never felt insulted or demeaned by it. But when I was 12 watching Transformers Prime, I was flabbergasted at the idea of Raph being 12. I was mad. I was like, this crybaby, this infant, they, they're saying he's 12? Like, I was like getting heated with my friend. I was like, these writers have never met a 12 year old. These writers have never seen a 12 year old. 12 year olds don't cry, we're men. And I definitely suspect that if there's any kids nowadays who are like I was back then, 
they're going to be feeling the same thing when it comes to Robbie and Mo. I think they act way too young for their age. I think kids are going to feel kind of insulted the way I did with Raph. Another example of out of touchness. There's a new Transformer named Hashtag. As if that's a hip, trendy thing with the kids. I mean, going hashtag shopping, hashtag whatever, was a thing in like 2012 when millennials were teenagers. But now it's nothing more than a boring, functional part of using social media. Most of the writers are millennials. Do, do they think that's still a thing? I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to me. It'll happen to you. Boomers! I'll never be 30. A downfall of the character's telepathic link is that they will often just say what each other are feeling. Like, very, very frequently, and I think it's just unnecessary. <laughs> hey, you're not upset anymore. It was fine in the first episode or so, but you don't have to be an empath to see what emotion these characters are feeling here. Have some faith in your storyboard team and animators. They're able to tell the emotions of the story without the Maltos explicitly stating each other's emotions on a regular basis. My main critique is that I think the show just has too many characters to split its focus between. I thought that as early as the first batch and that was confounded with the arrival of three new Terrans. The show's main cast consists of Robbie, Mo, Twitch, Thrash, Dot, Alex, Bumblebee, Nightshade, Jawbreaker, and Hashtag, with Optimus and Megatron regularly showing up in leading roles. That is 12 principal characters. And I think the show really struggled to juggle this many shifts in POV, especially given the fact that just about every single episode introduced or showcased one or two new characters outside of this group. When an Earthspark episode decides to introduce Soundwave, RC, Frenzy, Ravage, and Laserbeak all at once, a big chunk of the main cast will inherently have to take a back seat. Eleven main characters also leads to some laughably cluttered shot compositions, but what else were the board artists supposed to do here? This is just so many characters. It's like someone at Nickelodeon was trying to make a new password and thought at least eight characters was referring to the show they were working on. They're spread way too thin, and by the end of the season, We've spent a surprisingly small amount of time with these guys, given how many episodes there are. Thrash, for instance, doesn't have a single showcase episode in the second or third batch. His character gets completely left behind. In my opinion, it should have just been the two Terrans created in the pilot. The three newcomers in episode 9 were too much, and I suspect that their introduction was delayed for exactly this reason, when it probably should have been cancelled. Jawbreaker's struggle to find an alt mode that matched his personality was a good story, but it's a trait that could have been combined with others in a single character. Here's my solution. Have Twitch and Nightshade get created in the pilot, because they're the two coolest looking ones. Give Jawbreaker's alt mode struggle to Nightshade. Fold Hashtag's love of internet and film culture into Twitch. Unless I'm missing something, I don't think Thrash has any personality traits that aren't already reflected in the rest of the team. He's a hothead, but so are Robbie, Moe, and Twitch. At least. He's rebellious, so are all of them. We're totally gonna help B, right? Obviously. He could be eliminated and the group dynamic wouldn't lose a thing. I think they should have developed two stronger, layered characters rather than five thinner ones. And now we'll jump to batch two, starting with the good. <laughs> I think Batch 2 is where the show finally found its identity and decided what kind of stories it wanted to tell. Maycat joined as a story editor in this second Batch, which makes me wonder how much of this can be attributed to her. The episodes are all about identity, as the new Terrans search for alt modes and try to learn who they are. As I stated in the beginning, every episode is meaningfully about something, and this Batch is where the show established that rhythm. The second Batch's finale is one of the series' highlights, as the Terrans discover bigotry for the first time and learn how to deal with it. It will be really difficult to change things for the better, as long as hateful people try to control what Cybertronians need to survive. It isn't subtle, but it doesn't need to be. Earthspark paints an image of the Transformers as immigrants, which, if you really think about it, they are. In almost every series, we universally see them come from a separate world, learn a new culture, and often they aren't fully accepted. It's wild to me that it took this long for a Transformers show to acknowledge that. Transformers go home? But we were born here. This is our home. 
And I think they're doing it in a really tasteful way, where it might not be obvious to the kids watching what these episodes are actually about until they get older. Whoever wrote that trash probably meant Decepticons, so it's not like it's even about you. But it doesn't say Decepticons, it says Transformers. This episode made Mandroid as a villain. In the first batch, he was nothing special, but it's here as his body starts falling apart, as his Cybertronian prosthetics force him to consume Energon to survive, as he's clearly in agonizing pain every second he's on the earth due to all his injections. He grabs my interest, and he becomes a genuinely terrifying villain, worthy of the main antagonist title. Another reason he becomes so compelling is because Home Part 1 and 2 makes it very clear he is the embodiment of xenophobia. He isn't just evil mad scientist, he's integral to the core message of the series. As it becomes clear to the Terrans that the world will hate them no matter what, one man represents that hate. Warmongering aliens who brought their violent war to my planet. It's you and your kind who make this world unsafe for me and mine. If Mandroid were real, he would be review bombing Transformers Earthspark on IMDb. His final form in the series finale is insane, like, what am I looking at here? Huge fan. I think Batch 2 was the strongest with some all-around stellar episodes. Lauren Williams' Security Protocol has another series best action sequence with its climax, and May Cat's Misconnection wouldn't have existed without Derek Wyatt himself. The episode in question recontextualizes what it means to scan in alt mode. Another mode is your birthright. I see no need for one. Aren't I sufficient as I am? Young one, alt forms aren't meant to complete you, as though you have a missing part. They further express who you already are. In every other Transformers show, a computer will just find the closest vehicle to a Transformers mass and that'll be it. But here, in Transformers Earth Park, it means so much more. Each of the three new Terrans get a showcase episode right off the bat in the second batch. And while Hashtag and Nightshade scanned theirs, Jawbreaker never does because nothing feels right to him. I thought there was something wrong with me. I didn't know why I couldn't just pick an ult mode like everybody else. Well, it's because I'm not like everybody else. I'm not going to be a car or a truck or anything like that. I don't know what I'll be, but when I feel it in my spark, you'll be the first one to know. This could clearly be viewed as an allegory for a number of things. I think sexuality is the first one that comes to mind. People usually don't come out as anything until high school or college because it takes a long time to discover that about yourself. But this could also be viewed as a theme very universally. Finding a career that's right for you, an ambition, a life goal, discovering who you are as a person. I think it's wonderful that Transformers Earthspark has actual symbolism, where you can sit here discussing the themes and what they mean. Because has any other Transformers show had that? I mean, Transformers Animated has themes. Nature versus technology, for instance, is accounted for in maybe a third of the episodes, mostly through Prowl, Sorry, and Black Arachnia. The organic characters who hate machinery are always depicted in a negative light. The technological characters who hate organics are always depicted in a negative light. And the characters who embrace the mixture of both are the heroes that we spend our time with. They're happier and better for it. Nature and technology working together! But there's nothing in Transformers Animated where you really sit here and ponder and question what it could mean. Beast Wars writer Greg Johnson's episode Warzone is also a standout, as Megatron takes the Malto family to the Space Bridge Memorial Park and teaches them about the history of the war. Seeing Megatron throw the Allspark through the Space Bridge, a twist on Prime doing it from the recent Evergreen years, was absolutely amazing. And the Terrans questioning why it should be their responsibility to clean up the previous generation's mess and the complicated lack of answers is really mature storytelling. And they brought back the flowers from IDW! One of the most haunting, shocking moments in Transformers history debuted on screen in such a beautiful way. It doesn't match up to the original, but it wasn't trying to, it's just bringing them into the continuity. Batch 2, The Mixed. On the subject of Maycat's missed connection, which is a season highlight to be clear, I do see a jarring disconnect between the casting of Tarantulas and the script he's presented in. He speaks about how he found a form that truly fit his personality. He's different, he's an outsider, and it's very clear that when May wrote this episode, she was imagining something like the Beast Wars voice delivering the lines. But in casting Alfie Allen, Tarantulas is just a generic, mild-mannered, polite British man. 
Like, listen to this voice. Does this sound like someone who would choose to take the form of a horrifying spider? Alt forms aren't meant to complete you. They further express who you already are. This is why you've chosen such a unique appearance. Yes. It does not. I think this is a rare instance where the casting department just missed the point of a character. But it's not show breaking or anything, so I just plopped it in mixed here. I am not a typical Decepticon. I am Tarantulas. Secondly, we learn Hashtag has the ability to control all trains with Wi-Fi, which is one of the most absurd things I've ever heard in my life. That is not how Wi-Fi works. Like, there's literally a joke Rick and Morty character who could summon trains as a superpower. And Hashtag does it unironically during serious dramatic moments. It just makes me laugh, even though it clearly wasn't supposed to, and I just have to know how the writers wrote this and didn't present it as a joke. and the bad of Batch 2. I like the Terrans as characters, but they definitely lack variety, as we touched on earlier. They all have the exact same reaction to just about any given situation. If Bumblebee's in danger, all five of them will unanimously decide to rescue him with the same amount of enthusiasm. Let me give you an example. Let's say Sari approaches the main cast of Transformers Animated and asks them if they want to play paddle ball. All five of them would have very different reactions. Bumblebee would be thrilled he'd get super into it and become competitive. Bulkhead would be bad at it and he'd be sad. I think Sari and Bumblebee would trick Optimus into thinking it's an elite combat exercise and he'd say, well, I struggle to see the practical application, but if you say so, sorry. Prowl would find it beyond stupid and wouldn't care, but he'd make a point to demonstrate that he's effortlessly better at it than everyone else before going back to his room. And Ratchet would just be like, I don't want to play no stinking paddle ball, and he'd walk away. There'd be a wide spectrum of reactions and enthusiasm, because this was a group of characters meticulously designed to be distinct from each other, to let the dialogue effortlessly evolve from them, as should be the case with a good ensemble. Let's say Miko comes home with a paddle ball. Bumblebee would love it again. Optimus would firmly say no. Bulkhead and RC might have a friendly competition to see who's better at it. And Ratchet would pretend to hate it, but secretly he'd really be into it and he'd play it when no one's looking. Now, Mo Malto brings home a paddle ball. All five Terrans would be equally excited to play paddle ball. All five would be equally competitive and that'd be it. The Terrans are lovable characters, but I think they lack a strong group dynamic. I think a reason for that is that they lack distinct voices. Nightshade is the only Terran with a distinct speech pattern. Fear not! I got it! Assuming they aren't discussing their alt modes, powers, or weapons, most dialogue of all six other kids could be swapped without consequence. You know, there's a handful of times we see Twitch and Thrash argue. Just because you can't feel my confidence doesn't mean I'm wrong. Just because you can't feel my doubt doesn't mean you shouldn't have it. But you could switch their dialogue and it still feel completely correct. Surely you don't blame all of nature for a few space barnacles. You don't see my game player turning everyone into zombies, do you? Actually... An animated swapping the dialogue wouldn't work and it wouldn't fit their characterizations because the bickering in this example stems from strong individualistic characters. The clips I showed are not outliers. The same can be said for 9 out of 10 conversations in both series. A problem that began to confuse and then greatly annoy me is the show's refusal to commit to its own internal rules. Sometimes Optimus will stress that the Terrans have to hide their existence from Ghost at all costs. I'm glad I was the first to check this trap. If Ghost had gotten to you Terrans before I did... They'd take you away forever. But in other episodes, he'll casually bring the entire family into Ghost HQ. Sometimes Bumblebee will say, Ghost could be involved, and we need to keep you off their radar. But other times he'll bring Twitch on a mission into Ghost with him. I mean, I think there are four separate episodes this season where the Terrans, sometimes with, sometimes without Bumblebee, will just casually waltz through the Ghost headquarters. Throughout the whole season, I was thinking, are there not cameras in Ghost? And then in one of the final episodes, Mandroid just happens to see them through the security cameras. I should not have better judgment than Optimus Prime. I am just some guy. In addition, in the first episode, Optimus called a ghost vehicle to come bring Twitch and Thrash to the ghost HQ before he decided to keep them hidden. And then that truck comes and uh-oh, it turns out Mandroid was driving it. And then the real truck comes and they go, oh no, Twitch and Thrash are with the bad guy. Did Ghost never follow up about these two robots Optimus Prime asked them to come capture? Optimus told them they exist in the first episode and it's just never acknowledged ever again. And I was really confused by that. 
This is a small town, which is almost entirely a staging ground for ghost operations, yet the Terrans walk around so casually in public during broad daylight. Alita One brings Hashtag with her to fight a rampaging Grimlock in the middle of Town Square, despite the fact that Ghost exists to respond to crises like this. But no, they just inexplicably never show up, although they do show up within minutes to an abandoned cemetery because there's a fight with Tarantulas. I'm picking up Ghost Chatter. Getting nearer. Our combat must have alerted their surveillance sensors. The whole season, I kept thinking, how do you know someone out and about in this town you're talking to isn't a ghost agent? And then in one of the final episodes, a man they're talking to downtown turns out to be exactly that, nearly leading to their arrest. I just found the characters, all the characters, not just the Terrans, to be so stupid because we know the stakes. It'd be like if the Autobots and Transformers Prime just casually walked down Jasper's main street without a care in the world. Earth Sparks a series with so much thick continuity between episodes with lasting stakes and consequences, and I just don't think there's an excuse for this. I mean, even BotBots is a completely episodic, silly little show, but if the BotBots just walked around the mall in the middle of the day when customers were shopping, that would break the premise fundamentally, and the showrunners were obviously smart enough to know that. I feel weird ending this video on a negative note, so I'd like to start with the bad of Batch 3. Keith David was cast as Grimlock, which I was stoked about at first, but then he gave one of the most passionless, phoned-in performances I've ever heard. Jawbreaker. Jawbreaker. Let's focus on helping you feel more fierce, okay? There's always room for me to be wrong. Maybe he just had bad direction, but I struggle to believe this man cared one iota in that recording booth. Go! His casting makes sense on paper. They basically one-to-one -one adapted Randolph Hurd's Bruce Banner take on Grimlock. They just explored the tortured aspect of his personality a little more. Cyberverse Grimlock is suave and charismatic. This is my traditional after-battle soiree! And if you listen to David playing Elroy or something, you can totally hear that energy. This is a man that knows how to marry his cousin! I think the difference is that in Community, Keith David was trying. The end result is that non-union voiceover artist Ryan Andes gave a considerably better performance as Grimlock than multi-Emmy winner Keith David. And that blows my mind. No! And that's also disheartening because James Roberts and Nick Roche and the crew of More Than Meets the Eye envisioned Keith David as their dream voice of Tarn while writing and producing the comics. And now I don't even know if I would want Keith David to play Tarn if he's gonna put that little effort into it. This is a just in it for the paycheck caliber performance that Transformers hasn't seen since one month ago. On top of that, this whole episode is a very boilerplate Talk through your programming, I know you're in there! Episode, which have been done to death and just failed to leave much of an impression at all. This episode also just has a circular conversation, which really annoys me. It's a huge pet peeve. You wanna come rest up and uh, maybe talk about what happened? I'm fine, see? And I'm, I'm busy getting to know the young ones. Maybe the king of the Dinobots wouldn't mind training a Terran or two. But I don't know about that. I'm fine. And spending time with a young protoform sounds delightful. Grimlock basically says the same line twice. They needed to polish this, that's really bad. There are definitely a handful of moments where the show didn't feel like it had a plan. Bumblebee's dramatically exposed by Ghost and forced to flee the Malto's farm in security protocols. Where's Bumblebee? Sacrifice makes us safe. Not on my watch. Only for them to reunite without much fanfare two episodes later, after which B just casually returns to the Molto's farm. At the end of Disarmed, damage to Robbie's cyber sleeve causes the Terrans to lose their psychic link to each other. Then they talk for 15 seconds about not feeling each other's emotions in the next episode, and then Mo fully restores the sleeves in the one after that. And it just makes me wonder what the point even was. Or our drip-fed teases that Mandroid and Alex used to know each other. Strange. I used to have a colleague that used similar technology. Alex. Alex. Only for them to see each other and just say, hey, we used to know each other. With no further elaboration or plot relevance. Alex, so nice to see you after all these years. Hun, 
What's happening here? Dr. Meridian and I used to teach at the same university. Is is that is that it? Is that what we've waited for? Like, yeah, obviously they know each other. We gathered that from context. An interaction which, by the way, occurred in a dream. Not only was it an underwhelming, pointless payoff, but I don't think it actually even happened at all. Or maybe it did. On that note, this episode, Prime Time, is the only one I would call a bad episode. Basically, Mo wishes she'd never touched the Ember Stone. Mandroid, meanwhile, just plops the Ember Stone on his chest, and this sends Mo into a Christmas Carol-style vision quest, seeing what life would have been like had she never touched the stone. How did Ghost even get this? In Batch 1's finale, it's lost in a cave collapse, and all the characters are like, we just lost the Ember Stone in a cave collapse, and they're all sad. And then here, Ghost just casually comes back with it. I guess they just dug out the rubble, and if that's the case, why didn't the Autobots think to do that? They literally view it as the future of their race, and yet they don't even look for it again? Back to Mo's vision in this alternate series of events. Thrash gets captured, no new Terrans are created, Robbie dies. It's all well and good, although it doesn't really make sense that Thrash would have been born if she hadn't touched it. Was it just a coincidence that there's two Terrans here, not linked to the number of kids? Also, her brother is dying, and the point of this is to be like, it could be worse, Mo, be appreciative for what you have. And that's so grim. In addition, she could still just wish that neither she nor Robbie touched the Ember Stone. That's still a perfectly valid thing to wish for, given how upsetting it's all been, and the show doesn't make any attempts to explore that sequence of events. The first half has some logical gaps, but I, th I think it's cool overall. Everything falls apart from here. As Mo is somehow joined by her brother, parents, and Mandroid in her vision. Is it really you? Yes, sweetheart. I don't know how, but we heard you crying, and now here we are. And at first I thought it was all still a dream, that she'd wake up alone. But no, at the end of the episode, they all wake up together. They were all somehow, literally, physically having the same vision. How were Dot and Alex sent on a spiritual journey? They have no connection to the Emberstone. They have no connection to Quintus or the Terrans. It seems to completely contradict the show's own logic. The family has this whole battle against Mandroid, which results in Mo severing his connection to the stone. This adventure also completely cures Robbie of his illness one episode after his reveal and fully restores the cyber sleeves and psychic connections. It's also frustratingly vague in regards to what's literally happening and what isn't. The events of this episode aren't mentioned again, and it just makes no sense. In the end, Quintus tells Mo and Robbie he chose them. But how? They just happened to ride their bikes over here and see this cave. How could Quintus Prime have possibly known that Robbie would ask for Mo to help lift this rock? No, I didn't see. It's fine. Give me a hand. <laughs> Oh, you don't actually expect me to believe you planned that! It's just complete nonsense to me, and I found it really frustrating because it was a narrative cop-out to just solve all the characters' problems through vague spiritualism without any clear or defined rules, seemingly contradicting rules that have already been established. I did not like it. Batch 3, The Mixed. <laughs> Something that stuck out to me during this third batch as it became clear which questions in my head were getting answers and which weren't is that the show describes a lot of its backstory in very ill-defined terms, which in turn makes the stakes somewhat unclear. We learn early in the first season that Bumblebee's been hiding from Ghost for years and apparently has some sort of history with the organization to the point where he cannot get caught but we never get any more specifics. And throughout the season, it's hazy and unclear why it's so important for B to remain hidden. And once he's finally caught, he's just thrown in jail with the Decepticons. That's it. Similarly, Decepticons will constantly tell the kids, Megatron's done some awful things. Would you work with him if you knew who he really was? And no one elaborates further. What heinous sins has Megatron committed? The show's clearly willing to go into some pretty dark places. It's able to have still image flashbacks to future Decepticons who haven't been modeled. So I don't know why they aren't explaining this. It's a remarkably similar pitfall to Cyberverse which never explained its world's history to the point that we don't even know why the war started or what it was about. Here, the whole show is post-war. It's not as big of a problem as it was in Cyberverse, so I put this in mixed just because Cyberverse shows us it could have been far worse. We did still get a number of good detailed explanations about things. We got a healthy amount of flashbacks, so it was ultimately just a handful of things that slipped through the cracks. With the in-game reveal that Ghost has been truly evil all along, we learned the Decepticons were right in their distrust. Optimus and the Autobots seem dumb for going along with it. But I'm mixed on it because you could sense great character work for Optimus. 
he aligned with Ghost in a desperate attempt to earn the respect of humanity, to prove himself as the good guy. But he clearly knew deep down Megatron was right, he was conflicted through the entire season about his actions, but he'd committed to this sunk costs fallacy, holding on to the hope that it'd all pay off in the end. I love this arc for him, but I hope he faces some consequences in the second season. I hope the Decepticons hold that resentment against him and Megatron, because Prime's misdeeds have been an undercurrent of the entire season, and as of now, he hasn't really faced the repercussions for them. And now for Batch 3, the good. Batch 3 is when Starscream finally gets a showcase episode after half a season of teasing, and is written by Mae Cadigan. When Mae joined the second season of Cyberverse, she breathed life into Starscream that was super invigorating, basically writing him as an abuse victim at the hands of Megatron. Mae hopped on the War for Cybertron Kingdom, and I think she's almost single-handedly the reason it's almost good. It gets an F+, but that's a 50% increase from the F- it had before. Starscream actually felt somewhat like a character now, but he felt largely identical to Cyberverse Starscream. And it got me wondering if Mae Cat would just be a one-trick pony when it comes to writing this character. But I'm pleased to say I don't think that's the case here. There's still an undercurrent of abuse, and I think that's just unshakingly how Mae interprets and writes this character. But she goes in a very different direction here. Tells a Starscream story I don't think we've quite seen before, where Hashtag pulls on this string inside of him that wants to be a good person, and convinces him to save his fellow Seekers instead of leaving them behind. Teaching him that if he hates Megatron so much for his mistreatment, don't be like him. And I think it was handled wonderfully. We're doomed. Have you ever tried positive thinking? This characterization in the script is so strong that even with Steve Blum doing the exact same voice he did in Prime, it never feels like Prime Starscream. He's very clearly his own entity. I don't think Starscream's role was big enough to justify drip feeding him for as long as they did though. Like Steve Blum came into the booth one day to laugh, then came back later to go grrr, and then came back to say three lines, and then by the end of Batch 2, I was like, where are they going with this? Why is Starscream here? And they told a really nice story with him, but at the end of the day, he's only about as significant to the show as the other supporting characters, like Wheeljack or Shockwave, not some big mastermind who needed to be teased 13 episodes before his showcase role. That'd be like if they started teasing Shockwave in Episode 1 ahead of his role in Warzone. And still on the note of the Starscream episode, Maycat once again writes one of the Batch's standout standalone stories to the surprise of no one. The Dweller seems like such an insignificant, obscure thing from one G1 episode to come back as frequently as he does now. But this is hands down my favorite depiction there's ever been. This massive monster they've awakened deep below the Earth. The whole horror aspect of it gives it the same energy as the Zillow Beast Clone Wars episode. Uh, I guess would be the most apt Gen Z comparison. Zillow Beast was crazy. He came back in Bad Batch, but who cares? Look at the diversity of Maze Transformers episodes. Full-fledged buddy cop comedy with Rack and Ruin. That's cause we're so stealthy. A dramatic episode about second chances that gives genuine emotional weight to something as casual as scanning in alt mode. Decepticon only episode about infighting in the ranks as they try to capture an Autobot running loose. And now an ancient monster getting unearthed surviving underground episode. I've been saying for years that she's one of the best writers in the recent history of Transformers. And I'm only realizing now just how versatile she is in the story she's able to tell. Beyond the Alex and Meridian connection, this season paid off everything brilliantly. There were so many plot points set up. Optimus's disillusion with Ghost, Schloder's hunt for Bumblebee, the captured Decepticons, Mandroid's alliances with Croft and her secret ulterior motives, far more, and everything got time to shine. The final five episodes are dedicated to wrapping up this season, which is much appreciated because I get very frustrated by shows rushing their finales. That's not a problem here, they budgeted their time very well. Croft's master plan has been to build a secret space bridge and commit cybertroning and genocide, basically. Schloder winds up in prison alongside Bumblebee. All Ghost Transformers fall under Croft's mind control and give the Terrans great enemies to fight against, showing off how far they've come along the way. With the defeats of Optimus and the Autobots feeling earned, Mandroid has become this horrifying monster to keep himself alive. Basically becoming a Transformer in his quest to destroy them, he's fully lost sight of his goals. You've lost sight of what you're fighting for, Mandroid! I'm not sure if that fits into the central metaphor of the series. Most anti-immigrant people don't become immigrants to destroy the immigrants. I think this is just something that also happened, which is not part of the core message. And you know what? It's really damn cool, so I'm okay with it. Oh, no, 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 wait, I think it's because he became an evil giant alien robot 
who was gonna be evil and destroy the Earth, which is exactly what he feared the Cybertronians were. I get it now. Starscream returns in the darkest hour, having convinced all the Decepticons to do the right thing and save the Terrans. That's amazing. During the fight on the farm, I was like, man, it'd be cool if Starscream showed up. Then he didn't, and I was like, oh, okay. But then he comes back in the finale. I cheered! I was so excited! And it's because of the arc they gave him in the Dweller episode. I wasn't just excited to see Starscream again, I was excited to see this version of Starscream again. All of it just came together remarkably well. It's easily one of the best Transformers season finales there's ever been, and I would say possibly the most satisfying ever. Like, Prime's finale was great, but Unicron wasn't introduced until said finale. So they introduce and defeat this big threat within a four episode span. Here in Earthspark, a whole seasons of story all culminated at once and reached their maximum potential. And speaking of Prime, was this the sound effect from its intro? I think the only competition for most satisfying finale would be Megatron Rising. But there, the Allspark has no consistent rules, some plot threads come back as narrative dead ends. It has overt flaws. Whereas nothing about The Last Hope sticks out to me as being a flaw in any capacity. Normally after the first season of a Transformers show, I'm sitting here saying, well, at least the future seasons have potential. After Earthspark, I genuinely don't think it's possible for the second season to be as good. I think it's gonna be one of those shows with a meticulously planned first season that loses steam in its second or third. I mean, the story is over. The first season is so complete. Meridian and Croft are dead. No one's working for Ghost. What will the second season even be about? The only loose strand is the idea that Cybertron's out there somewhere. And while there's certainly story potential there, I don't think much of it would be rooted in the events of this first season. Alex thinks season two will be about a war between the Cybertronian Cybertronians? Wait. <laughs> Alex thinks the second season will be about a war between the Cybertronians on Cybertron and the Cybertronians on Earth. And we basically get a Transformers show where Bumblebee, Optimus, Megatron, Starscream, Shockwave, Soundwave are all just hanging out together. I think that could be neat, nifty. Also, the green glow going around the Earth definitely gives me energy of the AllSpark fragments in Transformers Animated Season 2. I think that's gonna create a bunch of new Terrans they'll be discovering throughout the second season. But on the other hand, after Cyberverse Season 1, I predicted that Megatron would have died off-screen between the flashbacks and the present-day storyline. So I don't have a great track record with predicting Season 2 of Transformers shows. EarthSpark was produced by Nickelodeon, with the intent to air it on Nickelodeon as the next big flagship mainstream Transformers series that introduced a new generation of fans to the brand. But at the last minute, as the industry started clawing and scraping to try to make streaming profitable, it was relegated to the Paramount Plus streaming service. Transformers EarthSpark. Stream with your family this fall. Exclusively on Paramount Plus. I have to imagine that some people at the network were not happy about this, seeing as Paramount Plus isn't exactly a household service. If a kid wants to watch the new Transformers show, they have to ask their parents to pay like $15 a month, and if their parents say no, they can't watch it. But Cyberverse, meanwhile, which was cheaply produced as basically a placeholder show, which had no promotion or fanfare, is freely available on YouTube. YouTube, aka kids' go-to platform for entertainment these days. If a kid wants to get into Transformers, that show is right there, with no paywall and no barrier to entry. I could be wrong here, but I just have this feeling that the next generation of Transformers fans will have grown up watching Cyberverse. The ultimate irony is that Earthspark, which was intended to be a vehicle for new fans, wound up held captive on an unpopular streaming service and has had its reach and impact severely limited. But regardless of whatever its legacy may be, I found a lot to enjoy in this first season of Transformers Earthspark. What about you? Be sure to tell me in the comments below, unless you're cringe, in which case, don't tell me. Bye.